Ready? Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Kaplan. I am a member of AFOSR. I came here about eight years ago and have different jobs, and now I'm um, managing the systems and software portfolio, basic research portfolio for the Air Force. The Air Force mission is to fly, fight, and win in fly, fight, and win in air, space, and cyberspace. The cornerstone, the keystone of all of this is systems and software. I mean, we can't do anything without systems and software. I mean, that, that should be a no-brainer. Um, my discussion today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic research part and then the uh, future portfolio areas. So the, I was asked to talk about the basic research part. A lot of times, leadership and different aspects of DOD doesn't understand that what, what I do, what we try to fund, is basic research because it's computer science. So when you have a system, you automatically have a system, right? Or when you make a program, it's a product. And they don't understand, a lot of times people don't understand in general, that it's basic research, what we're, what we're doing, what we're accomplishing. So I was told to put a slide up here about basic research. So if we look at the delineation, oh, I should also mention um, my prior supervisor is here, Dr. Blackwood, and he used to joke to me all the time about I'm going to get an acquisition, you know, what BS or something. I have more acquisition training, I think, than anybody else at AFOSR. I, um, Spurdy, <laughs> Dr. Blackwood was. He's an awesome supervisor, by the way. Um, I have um, Spurdy Level 3, which is the highest level in s and &E. I'm Spurdy uh, STM in Level 3, which is the highest level. I'm uh, Program manage Management Level 2 acquisition. Um, I only have one more class to take for Level 3. Um, IT uh, Level 1, T&E Level 1, and I'm a member of the Acquisition Core. So I do know about acquisition, and I can guarantee you the work that I'm pr promoting here is 6-1. So if we look at the, this is the, uh, one of the definitions from the, our, our DT&E Congressional Report, that 6-1 um, includes computer science. All right? 6-2 is when you have a specific military application. None of the areas I'm speaking about today is a specific military application. It's a general trying to pr um, promote computer science to advance the field. It's basic research, so you can rest assured that it's all basic research. Well, I got this portfolio, and as Dr. Roach talked about it today, um, he was told to find, um, like, uh, to start up a portfolio. And this is what I had to do, too. I had to kind of start the portfolio. Even though we had a portfolio, it was kind of, um, um, you know, lonely and mis uh, you know, kind of like left alone. And because uh, there was a program manager before Dr. Lugans Lugansbuehl, and then when he left, it kind of got passed around to different people. So then it comes to me, and I spoke with my colleagues. I was a professor, as I said, for many years. And my last time uh, I was a professor was at Howard University. I was there for six years. Uh, so. I talked to my colleagues, I talked to other people in the field. Now, remember, I think you've heard other people say we couldn't go to any conferences, which kind of limited my ability to meet face to face with people. But I did contact them, and I came to the realization that the warfighter had needed two areas to look at to, to help them in the warfighter mission. One is legacy system research, which Dr. Um, Mike Kendra spoke about yesterday. And he gave a very good talk about, uh, he included the legacy systems. Like, we have s such old systems in the Air Force that we have to keep going. We just don't have, it's not a fiscal environment that we can eliminate these systems and just start anew. We have to keep them going. So basically what we try to do in computer science is fake them out. We, we use these legacy systems, we apply new, new technologies so that they, the old system can still run. That's one area. And the second area is new technology research. We have to be on the forefront, the cutting edge. We, we cannot miss opportunities to fund new, exciting research. And let's see. So a, a side note, uh, these areas are in continual flux. Like, what's new today 
might be different next year, totally different, a whole different uh, area pops up. So here's a multi-core example. So a core is a CPU that ex reads and executes programs and instructions. A multi-core is a single computer component with more than one independent core. So there can be no numerous uh, processors that are together now, working together. And here's an example. Um, Intel had a core duo in 2006, and then the uh, 2012 Knight's Corner chip has more than 50. 50 cores. That's an increase of um, 2,500%. I spoke with Dr. Miller, my, my neighbor, my little colleague is next door to me. And we were discussing this and basically he agrees with me that it's a whole new technology. You don't have 2,500% uh, 2, change. It's a new technology that popped up between 2006 and, and now, about well, 2012. So it's, it's a whole new state of the art. Unfortunately, AFSR missed this. We, we try to be on the forefront of many things, and because of the continual change in the program, we, we missed this. We didn't have many people funding this at all, especially not in 2006. So when I was researching areas to go into, I did find that, um, that uh, there was a few uh, areas of support in this. One, uh, Dr. Pomranke had a uh, YIP that touched up upon multi-core computing. Dr. Farooq talked about this yesterday, about her STTR, which she started funding, I think, in 2011 or 2012. And um, Dr. Lugensbuehl had two, which one was a YIP, and one was from his core. So as far as the core funding, it's been very limited. Um, so it's something that we have to think about in the future, you know, how to keep up with this brand new technology, how to find the people that are doing the new technology and support them so that we're on the cutting edge and, and we don't miss many um, new changes. So today I'm talking a little different. Since I made this new direction for the portfolio, I I'm not going to talk about prior uh, support, but I'm going to talk about the new support, the new support for the warfighter as we go forward. And since I'm talking about new support that I have to put a caveat, may or may not be funded because we never know how the funding's going to work. These are not officially funded as of today. They're selected for support. Uh, I'm not going to give a whole bunch of details because I don't want to give away all their, um, their ideas, but I'll give you the rough <coughs> overview and why I think these are important to us. Um, Multi-core, obviously, I, I, that's multi-core, many-core. Now, as we go to more than 50 processor, 100 processors, that's called many-core. So going from multi-core to many-core. So these are areas that we have to continue to work with. And we have to, uh, in systems and software, we look at the operating system, we look at how the data is transferred, we look at um, all different aspects of a multi-core, how processors interact with each other. I've also looked at the virtual machine um, level software transactional memory um, browsing. Um, that's an interesting um, one to um, browsing. If you don't know, all of our, most of our training, I should say, a lot of our training, especially the warfighter training, is you, they train by video. And there's not a whole lot of support as a basic research level for the Air Force in these um, compression, how to compress videos. So I thought that was an interesting area in basic research to look at. And um, some other research areas we'll talk about too. These are all new areas to AFOSR. There's very little funding. I discussed some of the multi-core funding that we had done, a very few. There's been no funding in um, virtual machines, no funding in transactional or concurrency refractory, refactoring. Sorry. Um, two of the professors from this list were funded years ago under Dr. Lugensbuehl, and um, most of them are brand new. They're from new university, well, university, not new universities, but universities we haven't previously funded. So I have faith that all these ideas are going to skyrocket. They're going to be very successful. Their students will be successful. And we'll have great research to applaud in a few years. 
So the first one, I, oh, and I have to say this too. Um, did, I got a question about the different colors I used on the top of the slides. I'm just a maverick, I guess. I just use different colors to separate the different um, topics that I have. They, they don't mean anything. So the first one, and what I did was I went through these just to make it easier to understand. Again, I was a professor. And I talk about the research issue, the proposed solution, and um, the objection, uh, sorry, the objectives, and um, how I think that the warfighter is going to benefit from these. So the first one is um, multi-core real-time mixed criti criticality framework for avionics. And the research issue is, issue is how to implement and validate real-time avionics software on multi-core platforms so the underlying hardware platform is effectively utilized. And the solution is to extend mixed criticality, criticality scheduling from uniprocessors, uniprocessor platforms, sorry, to multi-core platforms and to research resource allocation Location infrastructure. So what do I mean? <laughs> All right, so here's an example. Um, here we see a little graph, and we have um, four processors cores. Right? We have four cores. And we have four le levels of criticality, A through D. So A is the highest, so that's going to be process first, and then B, and then C, and then D. And you can think of them as like um, different levels. So uh, our A might be flight critical software, the B might be mission critical software, uh, C might be planning comp computations, and then just remaining tasks for best effort. So how do we, um, if we have different processors, different things going on, how do we allocate our time? How do we decide if we're going to check data beforehand, if we're going to check it afterwards? Pessimistic means that we're going to check things beforehand to make sure there's consistency checks beforehand. And uh, optimistic means that we're going to wait. We're going to hope that it's good and, and that uh, later we can check to make sure it's OK. So um, you can see if something's very critical, we have to do this um, juggling. You know, are we going to waste time to check first, or are we going to wait until after? Are we going to do it first, or are we going to maybe skip that step and do something else? So there's a lot of trade-offs here. So this research is trying to see what's the best way to allocate our time, and allocate our cores, and allocate our levels. So the approach is to uh, limit the impacts of deviations, realize functionality, enable mode changes, enable highly dynamic runtime, strengthen schedule guarantees, and the rest. It's, it's a quite ambitious approach. And the benefits is it's going to enable certifiably, certifiable sorry, multi-core based flight software in the nation's next generation of UAVs. So that's the hope and the benefit of this research eventually, <laughs> okay? And that um, the future a UAVs will have far greater autonomous capabilities, be significantly better equipped to adapt to changing environmental conditions, and so forth. It's going to expand the state of the art by developing new techniques for multi-core real-time intermixed criticality frameworks. All right, the second one is um, scalable fault, oh I should have said that's Dr. Anderson too. Sorry Dr. Anderson if you're listening. Um, it's by uh, Dr. James Anderson, he's a professor at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He's a PI that we had funded many years ago for a, a different, um, different effort. The second one is um, by Dr. Benoit Ravindran, he's a professor at Virginia Polytech. He um, is going to work with on scalable fault tolerant operating system for many cores and multi core platforms. And what's the issue here is that, again, it's a time issue. When you have different cores and you have system calls that go back and forth, and this is the system calls in the red and the green, this takes time. It takes time to do these system calls. Are you going to do the system calls? Um, uh, you know, when are you going to do them? Are you going to do them all the time? Are you going to make sure that you get your data first? Are you know, um, uh, 
figure out what you're going to do with the data. If it has to be changed, you're going to send it back. So there's a lot of issues here. Now what I like about this is that it can be applied to our legacy systems. And basically, as I told you before, just kind of fake out the legacy system. Um, it deals with uh, a multi-kernel approach. A kernel is a computer program that manages I.O from software and translate the request into data instructions for the CPU. So it's just another benefit, I think, that's going to help the warfighter, that we can use multi-core and many-core on these legacy systems to keep them going further. The approach is to really um, studying and doing basic research uh, with respect to Linux. Now, um, Linux is, I don't know if you know, but if you've probably read it um, in Air Force Times or wherever, that many systems are being changed over to Linux uh, for fear of worms and other issues with different so, uh, operating systems that are out there. And that the, the theory is that Linux is a more secure system. So researching and understanding the basic research areas of Linux is very helpful, especially with these multi-core and multi, many-core platforms. And the benefits is that, um, like I told you, the legacy systems. But the study will enable future applications to run on emerging high-core count multi-core architecture. It will transparently tolerate OS failures and achieve high performance. And hopefully get to petascale and uh, exascale computing. And exascale, I think, you know, is um, the brain, the brain, how the brain operates. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is fully automated concurrency refra refactoring of legacy sequential programs on chip multiprocessors. And this is Dr. Renovin, too. He's from uh, Virginia Polytech Institute. Uh, I don't know, and I should mention this, I didn't know any of these professors beforehand. I've never gone to these universities. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I just looked for researchers that were at universities that are cutting edge, that had a lot of students, a lot of papers, a lot of activity to generate new ideas. And uh, Dr. Radovan came up a few times and he had different ideas which I thought were very interesting. And he was willing to scale them down, some of his ideas, to be able to fund more ideas. So instead of having one large grant, multiple small ones, which I thought were very interesting areas, again, that could help the warfighter. So refactoring is just restructuring code without changing the external behavior. So again, another way to fake out the legacy systems, right? We have this legacy code, we want to change it, we want to look at the blocks so that we can use this on our, um, in the best way possible given the new technologies we have now. The research issue is how to automatically optimize large legacy code to explore parallelism of emerging multi-core hardware. And the solution is to develop methods to reduce development costs with respect to legacy software and hardware technology research. And there's other ones too. The approach again is looking at this refactoring, looking at the code, trying to break it up into manageable se sections and putting it back together in a way that it can be you know, run more efficiently. The benefits is optimization techniques for large legacy systems. I think we just said, said that. And new methods for automatic code parallelization and some other, some other benefits as well. The next one is adaptive runtime verification and recovery for mission critical software. This is about real time repair. repair. Um, how to verify mission critical software to ensure safe execution and completion of mission goals. So here we just have, um, this is a little example, oh I'm sorry, this is doc, uh, Dr. Scott Smolka, he's from um, um, Univer State University in New York at so uh, Stony Brook. So we have two systems, a redundant system, an advanced system, a baseline system. Um, as we look, as we run this mission critical software, perhaps there's some kind of error that, that comes around. And that we need some way to monitor the framework, to get the, the, to fix the code, and then to make sure that all the other parts of it know. So when you switch the controller, the controller can tell the different systems there's a repair. 
And the proposed solution, this is just a very simplistic, like I told you, I'm not giving away all the secrets, but it's just to preserve safety. You have different regions, unsafe regions, and you, so when you go from one switch, you're switching over from one system to the other, you just want to make sure that your safe uh, areas are, are truly safe. And the approach is to investigate overhead control, incomplete monitoring, predictive analysis, simplex architecture for cyber physical systems, and um, the rest you can read that. And the benefits is uh, new research with respect to high assurance mission critical software. And new research and system behavior during testing, debugging, and deployment. And new research in flexible and adaptive runtime verification. Okay, the next one is virtual machine level software transactional memory. Okay, transactional memory is a synchronization technique. So if you remember from, if you took computer science um, semaphores, that kind of thing. Um, it's a synchronization ab abstraction that promises to alleviate the difficulties with lock-based synchronization. Again, deals with read-write, um, shared memory, and and that's organized as transactions. So again, there was no funding in this before, or no support, I should say, from AFSR. I couldn't find it in our systems, at dealing with either virtual machines or um, transactional memory, which I think is a, is a pretty worthy area to fund. And here's this little example, you can't really see this, but if you see that little circle in the middle, that's a garbage collector. And what happens is when, you know Java, the, the language, you have Java, Java has automatic um, garbage collection, so it's constantly going out there and looking at memory and saying, you know, is that memory garbage and can we scoop that up to use it again? So how do we stop that? Because that's such a waste of time to continually do that. So this is just one way, one of the things he's doing is looking at that amongst other things. So looking at the memory management collection. And um, the approach is to research the critical components of an SDM system, including contention management, meta metadata, conflict detection, uh, closed nesting, open nesting, and so forth, and to design algorithms for a virtual machine level SGM. And the benefits are new algorithms and new methods so that we can um, you know, utilize multi-core architectures. The next area is integrated isogeometric geometric approach to engineering design and optimization of aircraft stru structures. Um, Dr. Kendra spoke a little bit about this yesterday, and what it is deals with is CAD, okay? <laughs> CAD, CAD systems. So if you know anything, this is an old chart, it's a Navy chart, but I think it's important. Um, that if you look at CAD systems, so when you design a something, you design an aircraft or something, you use CAD systems, well 80% of the the time that we we invest in making um, these new, you know, new new crafts for the warfighters, 80% is between the CAD environment and um, the analysis modeling space. Okay, and then you go from the analysis modeling space to the um, finite element model and then to final analysis. Well, the, for, to go from that second part, the finite um, element model to the analysis is 20%, but to go from the CAD design to the um, analysis modeling space, where you generally generate an analysis um, model geometry is 80%. So that's the time constraint that you have is 80%. So we want to reduce that, right? Because if we go to war, we don't want to say like, oh, we can't have that done for 10 months. Sorry, we can't go to war right now. You know, we, we need to waste our time going from Mark Had to something else. So this is just a way to speed it up, or his idea to speed up this this 80% to get a lower. And he's using um, T-splines. Um, T-spline surfaces are just mathematical models uh, and computer graphics for generating and representing curves and surfaces. So the approach is um, to leverage, re leverage recent advances in computer-aided design, analysis and optimization, and so forth. An interesting thing about this is that um, that this is looked at in many different areas and um, 
Siam just published in two, December, I think, 2013, uh, a whole um, journal of articles just based on this, uh, that, you know, reducing that 80% time for CAD systems. So it's extremely topical. Um, it's a basic research area. And the benefits is just the elimination of all mesh generation and geometry cleanup steps for the proposed class of problems and improve the state of art. Okay. The next one is this um, motion imagery browsing. So browsing, efficient browsing, is when the data doesn't have to be sent more than once. So if we do training, okay, you do training on, um, you use, uh, you know, video training, and it goes down, you know, a lot of times it goes down, you oh no, you have to start the training again. Or some other thing with video, you're taking videos of, um, you know, uh, war, Aircraft is taking videos of the ground or of uh, maybe some surveillance. And we want to make sure that this is efficient browsing, that we're actually, um, you know, making the most of our technology. So um, video compression techniques have been around for a while, but they still need to be improved upon. They're, they're no way near um, perfect, let's say. So the research issue is how to obtain more efficient motion imagery, imagery compression as time frames, as frame rates increase, sorry. And the proposed solution is new motion imagery compression approach that facilitates excellent, uh, sorry, efficient video browsing. And this is um, Dr. Woods, he's a professor at Rensselaer. He is um, doing this as a joint effort with Dr. David Taubman of, um, in Sydney, Australia. And the, Dr. Taubman is like a, an authority on um, JPEG and JPEP. And he designed, he's the originator of the Epcot Wave um, coder. We're not s supporting Dr. Taubman's area, we're supporting um, Dr. Woods, but they're working in conjunction. So they're taking two different approaches, seeing which one works, combining them to get the best result. And this is Dr. Woods' approach. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but you see some high-pass filters. You see the motion, ME is motion estimator. Um, so it's just, you take a spartial video and you put it through the system and so let's see what the results will be as, uh, as the research goes on. Okay, so the approach is to research algorithms to improve JPEG 2000, take advantage of interframe de dependence while preserving JPEG 2000 interactive protocol, which is JPEG interactively, and research new algorithms and research novel approaches. And the benefits are more efficient communication and storage for motion imagery, browsing at higher rate frame rates. And um, I just have this little example here. That's uh, Dr. Tomlin's, his approach. He's going to start one approach. Dr. Wood's going to start the other. And um, hopefully they'll, they'll come up with some really great new areas in basic research. The next area is mega core operating system and chip architecture co-design. And the research issue is how to manage many core chips and data centers. And the proposed solution is to investigate how to create single system image operating system which scales across future many core chips and data centers. And this is Dr. Wenslaff, assistant professor at Princeton University. This is a YIP, so um, he's a relatively new professor. And I think that this is going to be a very interesting area to, to look at. It's a combination of all the years. So he's tackling everything. He's tackling, tackling the software, the hardware, um, and in between. And he's looking at amounts of buffer space in the I.O. and trying to reduce that. Because the buffer spaces in, in uh, input-output be, can become significant, especially as we have more processors, right? So you can think of a, more processors have a little tiny memory cache. And so um, how do you, you know, efficiently use all these? So as the number of core, cores in a chip grow, this storage space will dominate the size of the chip. So how, how can we tackle that? 
And here, this is just an example of a shared multi-tenant accelerator core um, where, you know, it's multi-tenant, so they, like a tenant in a building, you share everything. And the approach is to research software algorithms. I said he's, they're doing a, quite an extensive approach. Software, hardware, cross-layer integration, looking at everything across the board. Um, I think that there'll be pretty exciting research that will come out of here. The benefits of scalability, operating system characterization on current and future architectures, investigation of the expansion of a scalable operating system to the data center, um, and so forth. My next one is another YIP. Um, this is from Dr. Ning Fang Mi, assistant professor at Northeastern University. And it's integrated management layer research to administer heterogeneous resources in dynamic workflow driven clusters. The research issue is how to determine the best application platforms and the proposed solution is to investigate a new resource management layer between diverse applications and heterogeneous servers. So the proposed management layer is going to be able to support the execution of diverse applications in heterogeneous platforms to make sure we find the best um, operating system to use for our applications. As we, you know, it's going to, you know, increase performance, energy efficiency, and allocates correct server resources. The approach is to develop a new capacity modeling t methodology to actively predict application performance and reliability on a given platform. And uh, here we see he's going to utilize the good old-fashioned Markov chain of a model capturing system workloads and failure events. Um, I think his approach is, is very good and i um, very happy to, you know, support his, his research and I think that we're going to see great things from him as time goes on. Again, he's a yip, he's a yip so a relatively new person in our, in our field. The benefits are development of advanced models for actively predicting performance and reliability, research and new research allocation al algorithms, and so forth. So in conclusion, Systems and software is a cornerstone of all s and <laughs> The Air Force relies on s and We have two huge issues to deal with. One is our legacy systems. So we need to be able to use our legacy systems wisely and effectively. The second one is we need to be on the forefront of new technology. We cannot miss out and we have to be there. You know, we don't want to have more um, computer science breakthroughs and us not being part of them. You know, we want to, to know what's happening. The issues, um, so that's, that's what it really comes down to. Again, I, I kind of had to, as Dr. Roach had to, start up a new portfolio and try to think of what I thought the warfighter needs. You know, what, what is the cutting edge research that has to be looked at now to help you the legacy systems or new technology? Um, I have my little groups, many groups, of um, reviewers who looked at the different proposals. And again, for those people out there, I'm, I was a professor, I know what it's like to put research out that's it's not accepted. Uh, it's, it's very daunting, but I suggest that you just keep <laughs> and keep submitting things. We can't fund everything. We had so many good ideas that unfortunately we couldn't fund everything. Um, another issue though is that be, it's constantly in flux. So we need to be on the cutting edge, but you need someone here to identify the cutting edge. And I'm leaving, <laughs> I'm probably going to be leaving if that all goes well, and I'm going to be uh, going to RAND next year in Santa Monica. So there has to be somebody to take my place and to push the portfolio forward for the warfighter, for a nation, and um, hopefully I gave them a good basis, at least to start. The BAA, if you looked at the BAA, it's very general. And I purposely wrote it very general so that the next person coming in could, could 
take this very general BAA and to work it in a direction that they feel is best at that moment for the warfighter. Again, it changes rap so rapidly that I couldn't possibly say in five years what they should be studying then. It has to be that new person coming in. It's a portfolio that really should be looked at every year and either reconfigured or something, you know, to try to figure out what's the best way to go forward. So thank you, my time is up, I only have 26 seconds. Thank you all. No questions in my 16 seconds? Okay, thank you. Thank you.